The idea for this video came to me after being asked the question, why do rockets fly into space not in a straight line, but along curved paths? In this video, we will certainly answer this question, and at the same time, we'll have a good reason to talk about the basics of space navigation. In simpler terms, how our spacecraft move in space and what challenges and opportunities arise in the process. Subscribe to the channel and let's dive into it. So, let's consider what would happen if a rocket were to launch as many believe it should, vertically upwards. Well, in this case, we would indeed be able to reach space because our engines are powerful enough to overcome Earth's gravity. However, sooner or later, the fuel in the engines will run out and they will shut down. Gravity, on the other hand, will not go away and the rocket will simply fall back to Earth. The only way to remain in space after the engines are turned off is to launch the rocket on one of the specific trajectories known as low Earth orbits. The simplest case of such a trajectory is a circular orbit at a certain altitude. In one of our previous videos, we discussed that if an object moves under the influence of a force that is constant at every moment and directed perpendicular to its velocity, the trajectory of the object will be a circle with a radius r. The absolute magnitude of the velocity in such motion remains constant, making the movement effectively endless. The body seems to fall infinitely towards Earth or another gravitating body, but constantly misses it due to its velocity. The acceleration acquired under the influence of such a force is called centripetal acceleration, and it can be determined by dividing the force magnitude by the mass of the object. In this case, the force is the gravitational force, and its magnitude, and hence the centripetal acceleration, can be determined using Newton's law of universal gravitation. This leads us to the conclusion that for reaching an orbit with a radius r, our rocket must accomplish two things. Firstly, ascend to an altitude of r, and secondly, gain a velocity v tangentially to the orbit. This velocity is called the first cosmic velocity. From here, it should already be clear why rockets don't fly vertically upwards. More precisely, initially, they do fly vertically to quickly exit the lower, denser layers of the atmosphere. However, Gradually, they start to turn to begin acquiring velocity in the horizontal, or more accurately, tangential direction. This is done so that after the engines are turned off, the spacecraft enters into a rotational motion along a stable orbit. This brings us to what I would call the fundamental rule of space navigation. In space, you always have to be on the orbit of something. This means that any maneuvers of a spacecraft ultimately boil down to transitioning from one orbit to another. Moreover, during this transition, the spacecraft also moves along some orbit. This is why maneuvers of a spacecraft after reaching orbit are called orbital maneuvers or orbital transfers. And any space journey is always a series of orbital transfers following certain rules and laws derived from classical mechanics. We've already discussed one of these orbits a circular orbit, but the key condition for the formation of such a trajectory is the constancy of the magnitude of centrifugal acceleration over time. Centrifugal acceleration induced by gravity is not strictly constant, as it is inversely proportional to the distance between the bodies. A more general solution is elliptical trajectories, where the body moves along an ellipse with one of its foci containing the gravitating body. The point of closest approach is called the periapsis, and the farthest point is called the apoapsis. At the lowest speeds, the ellipse degenerates into a circle when the distances at perigee and apogee coincide. The orbital speed becomes constant, the first cosmic velocity for an orbit of a given radius around a given body. If we start increasing the mechanical energy and angular momentum of the body, essentially accelerating it, the circle begins to stretch into an ellipse, becoming more elongated with increasing speed. The velocity of the body along the elliptical orbit at any given moment is described by the following relationship, where m is the mass of the gravitating object, g is the gravitational constant, r is the distance from our body to the gravitating object at the given moment, and a is the length of the major axis of the ellipse. It is easy to see that at the bottom of the trajectory, where r is minimal, that is at perigee, the velocity of the object will be maximal, and vice versa, at apogee, the object will move slowest. 
At a certain stage of acceleration, the ellipse seems to open up. We say that the trajectory changes from elliptical to hyperbolic. In this case, the kinetic energy of the body will exceed the potential energy in the gravitational field of the gravitating object, meaning that gravity will no longer be able to hold the object and it will be capable of overcoming gravitational attraction and flying away. The velocity corresponding to this situation is called the second cosmic velocity. The first and second cosmic velocities are related by the following relationship. Given the above, it is easy to understand what needs to be done to transition from one orbit to another, that is, to perform a gravitational maneuver. Essentially, we need to increase the energy and angular momentum of our spacecraft, that is, generally speaking, accelerate or decelerate it in a direction using its engines. The second major rule of space navigation sounds like this. How you change the velocity of your spacecraft at a certain point in its trajectory will affect the position of the opposite point of its trajectory. For example, if you start accelerating at perigee, it will lead to an increase in apogee distance and vice versa. In principle, at this stage, we know everything necessary to understand how the most basic orbital maneuver, known as the Hohmann maneuver or Hohmann transfer, named after its inventor, Walter Hohmann, is performed. Suppose you need to increase the altitude of your orbit. This is a quite typical situation encountered in almost every space flight when a launch vehicle places a spacecraft into a so-called low parking orbit or waiting orbit at an altitude of about 150 to 200 kilometers. And then the spacecraft, using its own engines, performs an orbital maneuver and transitions to the intended orbit, whether it's a low Earth orbit or an orbit representing the trajectory of some more distant space journey. So, within the framework of the Hohmann maneuver, the spacecraft first turns on its engine at the perigee of the orbit, increasing its speed and pushing the apogee of the orbit further into space, precisely to the height where our final orbit should be located. Then, reaching the apogee of this new orbit, our spacecraft turns on the engine again to accelerate, leading to a further retreat of the perigee and the final formation of the orbit. In simpler terms, within our maneuver, we start with one orbit, transition to an intermediate orbit by activating the engines, which is also called the Hohmann trajectory, and then, through the second impulse, we depart from the Hohmann orbit, moving to our desired final orbit. In our case, the initial and final orbits are circular, but in principle, in the same way, one can transition from an elliptical orbit to a circular orbit, and so on, depending on how the spacecraft was moving at the initial moment and where we want to see it at the end of the maneuver. By the way, if you're interested, in one of our upcoming videos, we can talk about the types of low Earth orbits, their uses, and more. If you are interested, let us know in the comments. In principle, the Hohmann maneuver allows us to solve almost any problem in orbital maneuvering, and one might wonder why we need anything else at all. However, there is a reason, and this reason is called the Oberth effect. In short, the essence of the effect is as follows. The spacecraft's engine does more useful work, that is, provides greater kinetic energy increment to the spacecraft when it operates for the same time and at the same power, but at a higher speed of the spacecraft. This may seem a bit counterintuitive, but even after a fairly superficial examination of the formulas of rocket motion, it becomes clear that this is exactly how it should be. Indeed, let our rocket with a mass m move at an initial moment in time with a velocity v0, thus possessing kinetic energy e0 and momentum p0. In this case, it is more convenient to express kinetic energy through momentum like this. Now, let our spacecraft turn on its engine, and after some time, it ejects a mass delta m in the form of a reactive jet at a velocity v1. The impulse of the ejected reactive gases will be delta m times v1, and according to the law of conservation of momentum, the spacecraft itself will gain the same impulse. It is easy to understand that after turning off the engine, its kinetic energy will become like this. For simplicity of calculations, let's assume that delta m is much smaller than m, that is, this term in the denominator can be neglected. Then, the difference between kinetic energies before and after starting the engine will be written like this. Or, if we expand the brackets, like this. From where we get the final expression for the change in kinetic energy and see that it will be the greater 
the greater the initial impulse of the spacecraft. In space, there are no refueling stations, so reducing fuel costs is a crucial priority in planning any orbital maneuvers. And the Hohmann maneuver turns out to be not so great in this regard. During the acceleration at perigee, we will indeed be using fuel with maximum efficiency, but during the second engine firing to depart from the Hohmann orbit at apogee, the efficiency, on the contrary, is minimal. And when the difference in orbit radii is significant, sometimes it turns out to be more fuel efficient to maneuver a bit differently. The first stage will look the same. We again turn on the engine at perigee, where we can take maximum advantage of the Oberth effect. However, now we accelerate our spacecraft much more, so that it enters an orbit with an apogee much larger than the radius of the target orbit. Strictly speaking, the further it is located, the better it is in terms of fuel savings. Next, the spacecraft turns off the engine and moves along the new elliptical orbit, at the apogee of which it turns on the engine again, just like in the Hohmann maneuver, accelerating so that the perigee of the new orbit coincides with the radius of the target orbit. Now the ship moves along this second transitional orbit until it again reaches its perigee, where the engine is turned on for the third time, this time for deceleration, lowering the apogee of the orbit to the target value, completing the orbital maneuver. This maneuver looks quite strange, and it may seem that as a result, we will spend much more fuel. However, since we minimized the engine's operating time at the apogee and used it predominantly at the perigee, where the speed is maximum and the Oberth effect is most pronounced, it turns out that in some cases, the fuel costs from such a maneuver are significantly lower. As the spacecraft changes two intermediate elliptical orbits during the maneuver, it is also called a bi-elliptical maneuver. Applying a bi-elliptical maneuver makes sense when the height of the target orbit is about 15 times higher than the height of the starting one. In this case, we can indeed achieve fuel savings. However, the price for this is a significant increase in maneuvering time. Sometimes it increases hundreds of times compared to the time we would spend on the same transition along a Hohmann trajectory. Nevertheless, if it comes to launching an unmanned spacecraft, it often makes sense, as every kilogram of saved fuel means we can take an additional kilogram of useful cargo on board, such as equipment or something similar. In principle, through these two maneuvers, the Hohmann and bi-elliptical, almost any types of transorbital transitions can be carried out, even if it comes to transitions between the orbits of two different celestial bodies, such as a journey, for example, from Earth to the Moon or Mars. To begin with, let's understand lunar flights. Here, the principle is predominantly the same. In terms of space navigation, the phrase fly to the moon means enter lunar orbit, for which we first need to enter the same low Earth orbit in which the moon revolves. This can be done through either a Hohmann or a bi-elliptical maneuver. The first option is preferable if we are sending people to the moon or simply do not want to wait for other reasons. And if the priority is fuel savings and increasing the payload mass, we can use a bi-elliptical orbit. However, the Hohmann trajectory is currently the most typical for flights to the moon. To perform such a maneuver, we will need to additionally accelerate our spacecraft from a velocity of about eight kilometers per second which it had in Earth's orbit, to approximately 12 for entering the Hohmann orbit. Moving along such an orbit, our spacecraft will reach the moon in about three days. When planning a flight to the moon, it is essential to consider that the moon also revolves around the Earth. Therefore, in practice, we need to aim not directly at the moon, but at the position where the moon will be when the spacecraft overcomes the Hohmann trajectory. In other words, one might expect the spacecraft to accelerate at the perigee of its starting orbit to enter a trajectory with an apogee near the lunar orbit. Here, its speed will be approximately 2.5 kilometers per second relative to the moon. Now the spacecraft needs to deviate from the Hohmann trajectory, requiring a reduction in speed to about 1.5 kilometers per second to enter the lunar orbit which is typically around 110 to 120 kilometers above its surface. After that, the main part of the journey will be behind, and the focus can shift to the mission's objectives. However, in practice, the trajectory often looks a bit different, 
instead of following a familiar ellipse, spacecraft often describe a figure eight around the moon. This trajectory allows for even more significant fuel savings by utilizing the gravitational maneuver, also known as the gravity assist. The gravity assist occurs in a system where two bodies orbit a third in a way that their orbits intersect. It turns out that if at the point of encounter, the objects move in the same direction relative to the third body, the smaller object will slightly accelerate relative to the third body. If they move in opposite directions, the smaller object will slightly decelerate. If we were to orbit the moon along a regular elliptical trajectory, the gravitational maneuver, as can be seen, would lead to an increase in the velocity of our spacecraft when approaching the moon, which is unnecessary as we are already moving faster than needed, and we would have to turn on the engines to decrease our speed. Therefore, it makes more sense for us to use the gravitational maneuver for deceleration. Roughly speaking, to slightly bypass the moon and then approach it as if from the windward side, allowing gravity to do part of the braking work for us and save fuel. Conversely, when we need to fly back home and accelerate, we can use the moon's gravity to assist us in doing so, once again saving fuel. This is how the most common route to the moon looks, also known as the free return trajectory. It is named so because if the maneuvering engines of our spacecraft fail during the approach to the moon, the worst that will happen is that we will simply return to Earth along the Hohmann orbit. Moreover, even if our main engines fail after deceleration to enter the lunar orbit, the acceleration for the return home, considering the gravitational maneuver, can be achieved using only the auxiliary maneuvering engines. In space, there are not only refueling stations, but also repair shops. So when planning a spaceflight, you should have a plan B for as many scenarios as possible. Today, celestial mechanics specialists tirelessly work on developing more and more efficient routes to optimize fuel, time, or both for flights to the moon. Modern orbits, although generally within the framework of HOMEN or bioelliptic trajectories, are designed to maximize the consideration of the mutual gravitational influence of both Earth and the moon on the spacecraft. These calculations are quite complex since the two-body gravitational problem in this case transforms into a three-body gravitational problem. If we also consider the gravity of the sun, which is advisable, then it becomes a four-body problem, and such problems generally cannot be solved in a general form. The solution has to be conducted numerically, roughly speaking, by exploring all possible trajectory options, discarding unsuitable ones, and refining those that appear advantageous. If my dear viewers are interested in a more detailed examination of which trajectories are best for lunar flights and what effects are taken into account in their planning, we can dedicate a separate video to this topic once again. Although in broad strokes, we have already covered the question. We follow more or less the Homan trajectory if we want to reach the moon quickly and the bioelliptic trajectory if we want to do it with minimal fuel expenditure. Now, what if we need to reach another planet in the solar system, let's say Mars? The principle is exactly the same, with the only difference being that Mars does not orbit the Earth, but revolves around the Sun along with it. Accordingly, we need to make a Hohmann transfer from Earth's orbit with a radius of about 150 million kilometers to the Martian orbit with a radius of approximately 230 million kilometers. To enter this orbit, we will need to accelerate our spacecraft to about 11.5 kilometers per second in the Earth's reference frame. As a result, the far point of our Hohmann orbit, referring to the orbit around the Sun, not Earth, so it should be called an aphelion rather than an apogee, will be at the same distance from the Sun as Mars's orbit. When we reach this point, all that remains is to shed velocity to enter orbit around Mars. Interestingly, Reaching Mars using the Hohmann maneuver will essentially require the same fuel expenditure as reaching the Moon. Throughout both flights, we will need to change our velocity, summing up accelerations and decelerations, by about 6 km per second. This is because during the acceleration to reach the Martian orbit, we can take advantage of the speed at which the Earth revolves around the Sun, which is significantly higher than Mars. 
On the other hand, if the flight program includes landing on a celestial body, such as the Moon, we will need to have enough fuel on board for additional deceleration of about 1.5 kilometers per second. In the case of Mars, this would be approximately 5 kilometers per second, resulting in a total velocity cost of around 6 kilometers per second for the Moon and almost 9.5 kilometers per second, roughly one and a half times more for landing on Mars. However, the main challenge of flying to Mars lies not only in this, but also in the fact that the flight to Mars using the Hohmann trajectory would take a very long time, about eight months, even under optimal Earth and Mars positions, which occur roughly every two years. This is not a significant problem for sending automatic orbital stations, probes, and rovers to the Red Planet. Still, for manned flights to Mars, it becomes critical. Astronauts would have to endure confinement in a spacecraft for over half a year, facing all associated dangers and deprivations. Additionally, the spacecraft would need sufficient reserves of air, water, and food for this duration, increasing its weight and consequently fuel consumption for orbital maneuvers. An alternative is the so-called parabolic transfer, where, as the name implies, we would fly to Mars along a parabolic orbit, almost directly. In this case, the transit would take significantly less time. It can be managed in 70 days and even faster if using a more general hyperbolic trajectory. However, from an energy perspective, such a flight would be much less advantageous. To even enter a parabolic trajectory, we would need to accelerate relative to Earth to 16.7 kilometers per second. Additionally, it is essential to consider that Earth moves along its orbit much faster than Mars. So at the point where our spacecraft meets Mars, its speed relative to Mars will be an impressive 21 kilometers per second. Thus, the overall velocity cost of the flight from Earth's orbit to Mars orbit, in terms of velocity change units, would be an impressive 26 kilometers per second, roughly five times more than in the case of a Hohmann trajectory. However, when braking on approach to Mars, we can use the so-called atmospheric braking. In simpler terms, slowing down the spacecraft, not with the engine thrust, but by flying through the upper layers of the Martian atmosphere. Despite this, such flights are currently beyond the capabilities of our spacecraft. While engineers on Earth search for ways to expand these capabilities by developing new types of spacecraft engines, specialists in celestial mechanics and astrogation, on their part, seek ways to save fuel by choosing the most optimal trajectory. For example, there is the idea of optimizing the flight to Mars using the Hohmann trajectory and using a gravitational maneuver around Venus for velocity gain on the return journey. It turns out that this way is faster and more fuel efficient than going directly. Flights to more distant planets of the solar system require even greater changes in velocity and even more impressive fuel expenditures. However, the situation is somewhat simplified here because we can accelerate for free by performing gravitational maneuvers around celestial bodies we will be passing by. For example, by executing gravitational maneuvers around Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the Voyagers managed to accelerate to an impressive 50 kilometers per second relative to the Sun. The Juno probe was directed towards Jupiter in such a trajectory that it could utilize Earth's gravity for a gravitational maneuver. Additionally, for visits to the outer reaches of the solar system, an economical bi-elliptic trajectory can be employed to optimize fuel consumption, although this leads to a significant increase in mission duration. But if we are not in a hurry, why not? In general, space flights require meticulous preparation and intense work not only from engineers, astronauts, and others, but also from many hours of effort from qualified mathematicians who chart the course for our spacecraft through the cosmic abyss. Thank you to everyone, and until our next meeting.